Does it also help us get to understand how we got to a situation, and I'm going to load this up with a journalism question too, where, the whole, where, where suddenly America's in two wars after 9-11, it's in Afghanistan, it decides to go into Iraq, the media somehow or other doesn't scrutinise to the point where there's um, enough accountability uh, about what's going on. Um, at this time, you're, you're actually quite supportive of mm. the war. Mm. How, do, how do we get to a configuration like that? And what, what was it that made you decide that something had gone really wrong with the way that that had happened? Mm. Well, I should say, you know, our, my rationale, the New Republic's rationale for, for supporting Iraq was a little bit different than the Bush administration's. It was not about a connection to terrorism or al-Qaeda, which I didn't really think existed particularly, or about biological and chemical weapons, which I don't really think were much of a get to American security. It was, it was essentially the fear that Saddam Hussein would get a nuclear weapon, and he had actually had a, a crash program to get one on the eve of the Gulf War. He'd been right. pretty far along, so it was this feeling that he, that he was, since he had had essentially four years between 98 and 2002 of no inspections there, and a sanctions regime that was weakening, the, the belief was that Saddam Hussein was probably moving along the path towards, towards getting a nuclear weapon. But I think um, one of the failures of us, and, and just in general, I think, in the American press, was um, uh, there was a strong consensus uh, uh, essentially that Saddam must have a nuclear weapons program and some biological and chemical weapons. It was essentially a consensus across the two parties. All the Democratic presidents, all the Democratic politicians believed it because the Democratic foreign policy advisors believed it because the Clinton administration had believed it. Um, and, um, and with a couple of exceptions, uh, most of the people in the intelligence agencies uh, believed it. But in truth, there was very, very little evidence for it. It was a theory that everyone had bought into because essentially of a theory about who Saddam Hussein was. And f there was this kind of massive failure of imagination to, to imagine that, in fact, um, our understanding of the way that Saddam operated might be absolutely wrong. And, um, and, I, think, uh, and I think also the, the media, while not nearly as docile as, as it was before the Vietnam War, um, had become somewhat more docile than it was uh, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. Um, uh, and I think that was, um, was partly because of the impact of September 11th and a, a, a sense that, um, you know, the country was in national trauma and suffering and there was a wave of patriotism and you should try to be supportive of the government. The other thing was that the Democrats in Congress were extremely docile. So the media essentially generally in America plays off the opposition party. The, the opposition party levels some criticisms and the media goes and investigates and they work in a kind of symbiotic relationship. And so the media was docile and Congress was docile. And I think part of that was, that was the entire... And also the Bush administration was very ruthless uh, and dishonest in the way they dealt with a lot of the information surrounding the Iraq war. And I think it was that cocktail that allowed us to, this, to have this massive, massive failure, which was the, the, the non-realization that, in fact, there was no weapons of mass destruction program. So does this mean we're now outside of that third... Are we now outside of that, uh, the, the, the hubris of domination now? Is, is America in a... In a, different, in a different phase now. And, and, and what do you think of Obama? And is, what should he be doing now? Um, I think we're struggling to enter into this new phase. I mean, I think um, it is a little bit like the 1970s. I mean, I think it's, it's clear that the, that the vision that George W. Bush had um, of military action to prevent new countries from getting uh, nuclear weapons, of essentially America vanquishing every anti-American regime and movement in the Muslim world, uh, is, uh, is, is impossible. We simply don't have the blood and treasure to bring it about. Even in Afghanistan, you've seen that Obama has shifted the... It's like, just like what Nixon did in Vietnam. Nixon kept on defining victory down in Vietnam um, as the American people became more exhausted. And Obama has as well. He's not saying now, we're not going to destroy the Taliban. We're simply going to push them back on their heels a little bit so we can get them to negotiate and enter the government, which is very different than what we were fighting for originally. Uh, I think Obama understands that given the public's exhaustion, and even more importantly, given the crushing fiscal constraints that are going to influence every aspect of American, pol American policy in the coming years, America has to downsize its definition of what it's trying to do in the world, and particularly in the war on terror, as we tried to do after Vietnam. You, but you, it's very difficult to say that publicly. You, well, you just said it publicly. Uh, if you're a pre <laughs> if you're a, I, don't have to, I don't have to get elected, though. But uh, you talk about downsizing. I guess the question that, um, that I wonder about there is how does, how does a country like America define its interests? Um, is America now under threat in, in, a, in a meaningful way, in a way that you could look at it being under threat um, uh, in the Second World War? Um, what, what do you really make of 
uh, 9-11 nearly 10 years on, how do, how do you weigh up? With the things that are, it's obvious, yeah. The world's obviously not a safe place, but how do you weigh up America's interest? Well, the now? problem is that Americans, after the Cold War, really lost the ability to talk about interest at all. Because see, what happened was, there was a very standard way that America talked about its interests. It was first the Monroe Doctrine, Latin America. No foreign power basically establishing a beachhead in our, in our hemisphere. Then it became, with World War II, making sure that no Eurasian land power dominated the European continent. That had been the old British policy. First against the French, then it's against the Germans. Once the Brits couldn't do it, we stepped in. First against the Nazis, then against the Soviets. It was also then the Pacific, that we needed to have access to the Pacific as a trading power. Particularly the islands of the Pacific were always very important. That was essentially against Japan in World War II, then the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And then it was the oil fields of the Persian Gulf, um, because we needed access to oil. What, after the Cold War, what happened was, there was no threat to any of that. It was actually almost inconceivable. So it became very difficult for America to talk about interest. And essentially, America's definition of interest grew and grew to the point it was almost unlimited. And now, I think you have a definition that connects to a definition of the terrorist threat that I think Americans have, at least a fit in official language, that is really out of whack with the reality of the threat. I mean, there is some threat there, but public, there is still this official apocalyptic discussion about terrorism, like there was on September 12, 2001. We're certainly going to have another 9-11, or probably even 9-11 plus plus with weapons of mass destruction. Well, nine years, there's been no willingness to really publicly, I think, grapple with the fact that nine years after 9-11, there's been no attack on that scale anywhere in the world, let alone in the United States, where they're now resorting to one lone wolf, untrained per guy in their attacks, and that we need to, we have a definition of the threat that is out of proportion to the reality of it and is leading us to, to actually feel like we have to need to overreach in response to it. And that's not just internationally. I guess one of the, the, the biggest, by far, domestic issue in the States in the last couple of weeks, and I've, I've read what you've been writing about in the Daily Beast, is the controversy about the so-called uh, Ground Zero Mosque. And I think we should be, even the way that it's been described as the Ground Zero Mosque is sort of, uh, in, a, in a sense, pejorative and controversial. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, in my quest to try to find snippets on the uh, Australian election and the American media, of course, this issue just is dominating with Newt Gingrich probably being at the absolute extreme of saying, you know, we can't have a, we can't have a mosque anywhere near Ground Zero. Uh, now, you've written some pretty strident stuff about that. Tell us what's at stake here and what you think is going to happen. I think something very profound is at stake. Um, uh, and, and what's at stake is this. Um, America, uh, I have actually always believed, or at least I used to believe until a little while, until a month, until this started, um, was a special country in the sense that it was a country with an enormous amount of respect for religion, all religion. It's not like Europe, or maybe even some places Australia, where the expectation was that if you become an educated, sophisticated person, you shouldn't be religious. Um, and that um, is a source of problems in the United States. America's religiosity gets us into problems that can make... But it's also a source of inclusion, funnily enough, because... And Muslim Americans would say this, that if you go to some small town in the middle of nowhere in America, you say, I'm sorry, I can't eat this, I need this day off, I need some time off to pray, Americans, even if they know nothing about Islam, would say... Okay, you know, it's good that you're religious. I'm religious. We have our practices. You have your practices. Go to it. It's good. You have a moral core. That was really what George W. Bush believed. George W. Bush was genuinely ecumenical. He was concerned about atheists. But uh, he believed that if you had any religion, that was a good thing. Uh, Bush always reminded me uh, of this scene I remember once saw in Jerusalem in which um, uh, imams and Orthodox priests and Catholic priests and rabbis all came together. They joined hands together to oppose a gay rights march. You know? um, uh, uh, there was something, uh, I don't, I don't, you know, there, on the one hand there was something disturbing about it, but it, there was something ecumenical. It's, it's like a, the great Woody Allen line where he says um, in his stand-up comedy, he says, I won two weeks at interfaith camp where I was sadistically beaten by boys of all races and creeds. You know? um, so um, uh, one shouldn't idealize this tendency, but um, it was part of the American culture war, essentially a secular versus religious culture war. But in a way, versus vis-a-vis -vis Muslims, it was a source of tolerance, um, that, uh, that we could be respectful. And I think um, what has happened... Is that, that was, language? We, 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 after 9-11, very after much. After 9-11, yeah. Bush was good. I mean, Bush said he knew nothing about Islam, but he said Islam is peace. Islam is a religion of peace, because he believed, he believed in all religions. Um, and um, I think what we see now is uh, a much, much uglier uh, thing that has emerged in the Republican Party, where this edifice of ecumenicism is turned out to be a fraud. 
um, uh, and, um, and, and that it's essentially there's a core anti-Islamic sentiment there um, based on no knowledge whatsoever about the, about the subtleties and differences. This guy in, in Ground Zero is a Sufi. I mean, Sufis are systematically oppressed by Salafi uh, extremists like, uh, like uh, bin Laden. There's no knowledge of that. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's, uh, there's also a strong core of anti-Mormon sentiment that I think you see in the... Uh, Mitt Romney would have probably won the Republican nomination where evangelical Christians in the United States not so anti-Mormon. Um, it's part of the reason that I think it's particularly disturbing that uh, some Jewish groups um, have essentially been fanned the flames of this anti-Muslim sentiment. I think it's, a, it's deeply naive to think that you can play around with religious bigotry as a minority in a country that has its own history of religious oppression and think it will never come back to your doorstep. And I think the danger here, um, you know, people talk about this hallowed ground of 9-11. I mean, there are strip parlors within two blocks of 9-11. There was off-track betting. Uh, as John, uh, John, uh, you know, uh, John Stewart noted, this is in the, ho- the for- site of a former Burlington coat factory. He said, you know, it's true, any place you can get a you know, London Fog coat for less than $300 is hallowed ground. But um, uh, it's, the, the reality is that what, the precedent that's being set is, is the politicization of every effort to build a mosque anywhere in America. You say, no, we've got no problems with building a mosque, but we just have a few political questions for you um, uh, that you have to, you know, a little test you have to pass. Or there are some traffic problems that we're a little bit concerned about. And um, I think that is, that's, ba- that's dangerous for American national security, uh, and I think it's also a, th- a threat to, to, you know, to our basic principles. You've also been very critical, Peter, uh, and, and uh, I think... Um uh, you know, it's, it's worth just emphasising you yourself are Jewish, but of the Jewish community uh, or the Jewish establishment in Israel. In fact, one of the talks you're giving at the Writers Festival tomorrow night at eight at the Capitol Theatre. There's a plug straight away. Is uh, on uh, the failure of the Jewish establishment, and you wrote this piece a few months ago in the New York Review of Books, which basically took the line that the American Jewish uh, establishment within the states is not doing Israel any favours by uh, by uh, pulling up. Uh, pulling up the shutters and refusing to criticise Israel. And then in a, in, in, in a way, Israel needs to be uh, rescued from uh, veering away from liberal democratic values. Um, I'm really interested in why you wrote that and also what the reaction to that has been. Um, certainly, uh, it's created a lot of interest around, the, uh, around Jewish communities around the world. But what, what was it that actually made you write that in the first place? Um, well, it's funny. It is actually... Um, uh, this is going to be my next book that Melbourne University Press is going is to put out, so I'm very pleased about that. And that's, um, um, It was a series of, of things that I was wrestling with in my own life, um, partly as I had kids, and I saw, um, began to think about the options available to them as Z- Zionists, and I, I want my children to be Zionists uh, very much, as I consider myself to be a Zionist. And what I saw essentially was a bifurcation in which the people in America who felt, who were strongly Zionists, uh, didn't have a very robust appreciation, I felt, for liberal democratic values and for human rights. Uh, and the people who did have a concern, stronger concern for human rights and liberal democracy in general, didn't have much Zionism. That there was this, they were going to be forced to choose uh, between a connection to Israel uh, and the liberal democratic principles that I think are actually one of the real accomplishments of American Jewish political culture. Um, and, uh, and I felt that uh, American Jews needed desperately to try to find a way of integrating those things, by which I mean, I think, creating, creating a space for a more critical Zionism, for a Zionism which we say, if we genuinely believe it when we say that we love Israel, not just because it's a Jewish state, but because Jews created a liberal democracy there, then we have to fight for liberal democracy in Israel, not only against its external threats, but against its internal threats. And if you, if you look... Uh, uh, the internal threats are, are grave um, uh, with various different segments of the Israeli body politics, starting with part of the settler movement, uh, that I think are, are quite hostile to basic notions of e- equality under the law, freedom of conscience. Um, and, and I think that's a struggle that American Jews have to be involved in, and I felt like I needed to start it now so uh, it wasn't foreclosed by the time my kids were adults. What's, what's the reaction been? What do you think's been... Um, been, been the feedback you've got about, about going down this track? Um, you know, it's been much more positive than uh, I, a lot of people 
warned me, you know, a lot of people said, oh, it's going to be terrible, you will have no friends, um, uh, you know, um, uh, members of your own family won't talk to you. Um, my mother did say to me, you know, it's a good thing that your grandmother doesn't know how to blog. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, but, um, and I, um, uh, I have had some, you know, been uh, approached by members of relatives who I've been out of touch with for a long time, uh, who decided they wanted to get in touch uh, over this issue. But um, uh, I, I think there is every community, uh, I think, I only know the Jew American Jewish community well enough to say, but I think every community has its public discourse and its private discourse. The public discourse is for external consumption. The private discourse is different. Sometimes it's uglier, but sometimes it's, it's also very subversive. And, and you say things in, public, in private, uh, within closed doors, in a whisper, that you would never say for external consumption. And I think some of those things, there's a guy who I sit next to uh, in shul every week, and he, he's, a very, he's a very religious guy. He's very politically center-right, I would say, very much where the American Jewish establishment is. And he said, turned to me once um, uh, a while back, and we were watching our kids play, and he said, um, Israel's not going to be there for them. And I said, what do you mean Israel? What are you talking about? Israel's not going to be there. What are you, what are you, what are you said? I said, I'm not sure exactly. I just know Israel's not going to be there for them. And I think this, there is this sense that exists in, more strongly in the American Jewish community that, that, that Israel is being lost in some sense. Um, that, uh, and it's not only being lost because of the threat of Ahmadinejad. That's what people can talk about publicly. But underneath it, a sense that there's things in that society that are, that are emerging that we don't recognize it anymore. Um, that it's becoming more and more different from American Jewish, uh, American Jewish values. Um, you know, when you see a society with a larger and larger Haredi, ultra-Orthodox population um, that's continually using violence um, uh, for a very uh, kind of very illiberal agenda, uh, a Russian immigration that has produced a Viktor Lieberman who I think uh, uh, has um, a very, very authoritarian set of, of, of views about, about politics, um, and uh, not to mention the way that the, the repercussions of this terribly authoritarian, racist culture that has emerged in some of the settlements blows back into Israel itself. And I think, um, I think that there's a hunger to talk about that. Uh, and so I found that there, the ratio of gratifying conversations and surprising conversations to really difficult, unpleasant conversations has been actually pretty good. Mm. Do you consider yourself generally, when we, we've been talking for an hour about the, the troubles of America and the world over the last century, do you consider yourself an optimist? I guess my, you know, my source of optimism about the United States um, comes from the American capacity for renewal. You know? I mean, one of the reasons that I think America has been able to reinvent itself um, is that we have so many new Americans coming uh, and that our definition of who an American is has been flexible enough and plastic enough that essentially we've been able to solve many of our problems with the infusion of new people um, who bring uh, a fresh perspective and, and, a, and a, a hunger to succeed. You know, there's a sense of always been amongst American immigrants of a fierce desire to, to get ahead. And, um, you could argue the same about American. Australia, although one of the things that's striking to, to me and probably a lot of people in this room is that we've just been through an election campaign yeah. where the two major parties yeah. started talking about a small Australia where the... Yeah. Minister for Immigration got his title changed to the Minister for Sustainable Immigration. Mm. Um, is there a danger that America, uh, because obviously immigration is a contentious issue yeah. there, that there is a switch somehow or a dog whistle, I don't know what you call it, where people start to not value that as well? Yes, absolutely. I mean, America, although it's a society of immigrants, it also has a long history of people saying, our immigrants, our grandparents were great. These new ones aren't like them. They're terrible. Um, uh, so that's also very much the history of America. But th the source of my optimism is basically that what happens is the new immigrants come anyway. Uh, and then they come in large enough numbers and they start to vote. And they basically, they, they, they kick everyone's ass because they are just grow large enough in numbers that you can't marginalize them. And that's what's going to happen to the Republican Party. The Republican Party, by playing this anti-Hispanic card, may win an election or two now. But they're doing exactly what the Republican Party did in the 1920s, when the Republican Party in the 1921 and 1924 and two laws basically cut off immigration from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. Well, how do you think that made all the Italians and Irish and Poles and Slovaks and Greeks and Jews felt? It, 
sent them straight running into Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the Democratic Party, which dominated American politics until 1968. And I think the Democratic Party uh, is assembling a coalition um, uh, which will, in which Hispanics will be very, very powerful for a long time to come, that will be the demo, will, is rising demographically, and I think they're going to have the last laugh. A question about hubris. It, it, it happens when you're not paying attention to success, you're starting to fly too high, then you drop the bundle, really. You, you fail to analyze what's really what the possibilities really are. How do, you, how do you think it's possible to intervene in that scenario? If things are going well, at what point can your voice be heard mm. if you're a president or someone in power where you say, hey, guess what? We've just, you know, the stock market's gone up 120%, but everyone has to stop buying shares now, mm. or we're not going to have another war because, you know what, we've won, all the, we've won our last five, we're bound to lose. H how do you actually put the brakes on and avoid the cycle that you've been running yeah, about? Yeah, it's a really great question. You know, it's always very difficult to do that, you know, to, put a, you know, to have a little rainy day fund when times are good or to, you know, to, to recognize that things won't always go along in this like forever. I, think one I want to go to the races and stop betting after I win on race two, but I don't. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that um, part of the answer, I'm going to try to s talk about some answers to this, I think. One, I think one thing that's very important is simply, and it's a simple thing, but... Um, it's very important. The cycle of hubris tends to come because of bad analogizing. You say something works out well, and you say, oh, well, well, this will be a success too because that was a success. And that's and a good analogy. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, bad analogizing often comes from a lack of an understand, a deep understanding of the specifics of a particular circumstance. What made Kennan such a successful policymaker was, remember, a lot of people in the 19, 1945, 1946, when they were dealing with Stalin, said, oh, yeah, we know how to deal with Stalin. He's just like Hitler. We're going to have to go to war with him. And Kennan said, no, 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 no. You know, Kennan spoke Russian better than Stalin did. Stalin's first language was Georgian. He was writing a biography of Chekhov. He used to travel by himself, because, again, he didn't like people, for, for days and days and days throughout the Russian countryside. He had a very deep understanding of Russian society and of the, Russian, the way Russian politics worked historically. And he said, no, Stalin is different than Hitler. He's a monster, but he's, not, he's much more cautious than Hitler is. We don't need to go to war. We can, stop, we can stop him with measures short of war, like containment. So he was able to break the cycle of bad analogizing. And I think if you have one of the, one of the tragedies of American policy in Vietnam and Iraq, if you look at the people who made that poli those policies, virtually nobody in the room knew anything about the regions at all. They had been very influenced by other things. The people who made Vietnam policy were influenced by Europe, by the experience of World War II and containment in Europe. And so they analogized, oh, containment will work here. The people who made Iraq policy were very influenced by the victory over communism in, in Eastern Europe. They said, oh, we'll do the same thing here. We'll bring about democracy. And so I think if you have people who really understand the specifics of a place, they can put a break on this essentially escalating cycle of analogizing.